Hey folks, Alan Mandic, the Hot Rod Hippie here. This week's video, we're talking about flexible AC hoses. Every project needs to have some give somewhere in the build, so we're gonna talk about that. Let's check it out. Rather recently, I did a video on AC hard lines. I showed you how I made some stainless steel lines on the 1965 C10 that I've been doing. In this video, I'm gonna show you how I make the flexible lines on the truck as well. We're also gonna talk about why we need to have flexible lines on a build. I'm gonna show you the components that I use to assemble lines, the tools that I use to assemble lines. First off, let's talk about why. Why do you need to have flexible lines? This might seem obvious to some, but I just wanna cover it quick so we have it out there. Vibration is one reason. No matter what you do, when you've got electric motors and engines inside of a vehicle or a vehicle driving down the road, bumping along, there's gonna be vibrations transferred through everything. The flexible lines can help to isolate components from those vibrations. So you're not having a rigid line from your AC compressor to your fender or to your firewall causing that line or your compressor or your firewall to break. Along that same lines is the concept of give. We need to have give and compliance in things. If you've got your engine, even if it's solid mounted with motor plates in there, the chassis will flex in a vehicle, meaning that your hard lines would be under stress when that chassis flexes because they're likely not flexing the exact same way. So you need to have some type of give. It's just going to be a strain relief if nothing else. When you're talking about rubber or polyurethane motor mounts, as your engine rocks, there needs to be some give in there. Your engine may get farther and closer to your inner fender wells as it's moving, so there needs to be some line to move with that. And lastly is serviceability. A flexible line is just easier to work with and service. If you need to remove the AC compressor for a replacement or you need to work on the engine so you need to get those accessories out out of the way, disconnecting a rubber hose and manipulating it out of the way or reinstalling it is simpler than a hard line can be. So that's why we need to have flexible lines. Let's go ahead and talk about the flexible lines that I personally use on the builds that I'm doing and the different components that go into that. As far as your lines are concerned, you do have various options, but the one that I personally use is the beadlock style hose. When we're talking beadlock style hoses, you have a lot of fitting options. I personally generally only work with a small range of them and companies like folks at Vintage Air will sell you the individual fittings that you need and they have a pretty decent selection that really applies to the types of vehicles that we're often working on in the aftermarket automotive industry. The anatomy of the beadlock style fitting is pretty straightforward. On one end you have a swaged type of end meaning that the end is formed into a specific shape that is meant to receive your AC o-ring for sealing up the system. That little nipple on the end of there sticks into, say your, in my case, sand in compressor port, your bulkhead fittings on your firewall, or your bulkhead fittings on your core support as I'm dealing with on the 65C10. This is the primary standard that's been adopted by the aftermarket automotive industry. In factory type applications, there are other types of fittings you might run into, like a tapered seat design and some other stuff that is out there, but as far as the aftermarket automotive industry is concerned, this O-ring style of seal is the, pretty much the only one you're really gonna run across. And the other business end of your beadlock fitting is the actual collar, the lock, the part that actually locks the hose to the fitting. It has a nipple that sticks out of the actual fitting itself, and then a usually steel collar that is already installed on the fitting that will be the part that gets crimped and locked onto your hose when we assemble the line. The next component we can discuss in this situation is the actual hose itself. As I said, you have various sizes of hoses and there can actually be sub sizes within sizes that I've run across in time. It can be a little bit confusing. So I do really recommend trying to buy, not necessarily a kit, but maybe work with one vendor when you're trying to buy all of your components, buy all of your stuff from Vintage Air, buy all of your stuff from your local AC supply house, something like that. Mainly, you need to consider the hose that you're working with and it should absolutely 110% be a refrigerant hose. It is meant only for refrigerant. These hoses are multi-layer. They're similar to if you're familiar with like a fuel injection hose where it's got an inner layer, a woven structure inside of the layers of it, and then an outer layer. There are multiple layers to refrigerant hoses for multiple purposes. To my understanding anyway, one of the primary factors at play here is the fact that freon molecules are just small. So they can actually permeate through hoses that are subpar. That's why if you get a car, if it's just a really old car that nobody ever really broke the AC system, but it doesn't have a charge any longer, it could have just permeated out through decrepit older hoses. 
a specific refrigerant hose is gonna have an inner barrier that is simply meant to contain that Freon and keep it into the system, but it does need to be specific to the system you're working with. There might be multiple layers of that nylon or whatever permeability barrier is inside of there, and then there'll be a woven structure on the outside of that to act as a strengthening agent to keep that pressure contained in there because these lines are gonna have high pressure ratings, somewhere between 350 to 500 PSI working pressure ratings on these lines. If you have a system that's malfunctioning or even sometimes working properly, it can be pushing that 350 to 500 PSI range on a regular basis. I just wanted to break down the concept of what goes into a refrigerant hose. Not so much that you really need to know this information, just so much as to say, buy refrigerant hose. Buy something that is specifically intended for refrigerant. Don't try and repurpose something else as an experiment or because you like the look of it better. That's really not a good way to go about things in this regard. You're dealing with high pressures, volatile chemicals that could leach out into the atmosphere and hurt our world. There's no reason to risk it, risk blowing a line off just because it looked a little bit better. Now, just to double back, as I've said a few times here, when you're converting systems, when I used to work in Texas, I did a lot of AC work. And I very often had to convert R12 systems to R134A, or I was doing engine swaps like I had alluded to earlier in 80s and 70s vehicles, where I was putting newer engines with newer AC components on them into older vehicles. So I had to do a lot of adapting there where I wasn't necessarily working with vintage air AC boxes, but I was dealing with factory stuff. The best thing that I can recommend for you is picking up a physical catalog. There are companies out there who have big fat books just full of AC fittings. And they'll even list specific vehicles or manufacturers that use those types of fittings to help you identify what you need for your situation. More often than not, when I was working on a really weird configuration, something where I had to try and figure out how to adapt from one design to another, one hose type to another, I would just flip through the book and find the fitting that was gonna work and I could pretty easily figure out from the descriptions of the thread pitch and the size and, and the manufacturer types that this might fall into what was gonna work for my situation. Now let's go ahead and talk about the tools you're gonna need to do this job. Honestly, it's a pretty darn short list. First and foremost, you're gonna need wrenches, obviously, to tighten your fittings, blah, blah, blah. Wrenches, you're gonna have those. That's not that big of a deal. Okay, now for the more actually specialty tools. There are two tools that I use on a regular basis for cutting AC hoses. One that I'm liking at the moment is this right here, this simple cheap hose cutter. This actually came with the next tool I'm gonna show you, but it works beautifully. It's a cheap little thing they happened to throw into a kit that I picked up and it worked great and I actually really like it. The other tool that I use to cut hoses and I actually use this far more regularly than I ever thought I would when I bought it is a ratcheting PVC cutter. This design, the ratcheting mechanism allows for high torque application, makes it easier to cut things. It cuts a nice clean straight line. It's meant to cut a clean straight line through PVC. So the rubber hoses we deal with, it does a pretty darn good job with. I use it on AC hoses, heater hoses, filler neck hoses, though it doesn't love the filler neck hoses that have the steel braiding inside of them. But other than that, it works pretty darn well. Now, the kit that I alluded to that that cutter came in is the thing, the real specialty tool you're really gonna need to do this job. And that is a AC crimping tool for beadlock hoses. This is the tool that actually clamps down, squeezes that collar that I mentioned on the fitting that holds the hose in place. The one that I have here is a hydraulic design one. It uses a simple hydraulic cylinder mechanism that you hand pump and has this big clamp mechanism that allows you to clamshell it over the fitting. You select the proper jaw size from inside of the kit, which is labeled for the different sizes of hoses and collars that are available. And you just find which one's gonna fit to the application that you're working with best and squeeze. Pretty simple. I had two different versions of this tool. I have this hydraulic one that I picked up and used on the C10 and honestly have been pretty darn happy with. I picked it up off of Amazon. I'm gonna drop a link in the description down below. And I think I would probably recommend this one over the next one I'm gonna mention, but I also have a mechanical hand operated one. That uses a wrench or a ratchet to just turn a force screw nut, which is the same thing that the hydraulic mechanism is doing. It's just squeezing together jaws with the different adapters inside of there to squeeze on the beadlock hose. Now, in my opinion, this tool is rather reasonable, but if you're only doing one project, you're just building one car and you need to build lines for 
it may not be that reasonable to you to pick this thing up. So for you, there is a solid option. And that is going to your local AC shop or your local hydraulic shop. A lot of these places can actually get this job done for you. Check with yours to make sure they're going to be able to do it with the proper size of fitting you're working with. But it's basically a hydraulic crimp design. It's that six flat crimp just squeezing in on that collar to hold that hose to the actual fitting. For a single project, if you're just trying to get your project card done, that is a really solid way to go. And it's going to be cheaper to have somebody else do it than it will be to buy the tool to do it yourself. Now, if you do pick up the tool, let me show you how I use it and just give you some pointers when you're doing so. First and foremost, as I already mentioned, make sure you have a good clean cut on the end of that hose. It's got to be straight. It's got to be cleaned up. Once you have the hose cut good and clean and ready to go, it's as simple as just pushing the hose onto the fitting. Now, this isn't a press fit by any means. It's not like pushing a hose onto a hose bar where it's biting in as you go. This should slip together pretty darn easily. If it's fighting you, you probably have the wrong size fitting or the wrong size hose for what you're working with. Then it's as simple as choosing the correct dies for the fitting that I'm working with. So number 10 for number 10, number eight, number six, etc. Once you have the clamshell closed down around the fitting, put the pin into it so it's good and secured. And then it's as simple as putting the pressure on. With the hydraulic pump mechanism, I don't love that I have to kind of like hand operate it to do that, but it does the job well. With the ratcheting mechanism, you need to turn that nut down to tighten it in. And all you're really gonna do is go until it bottoms out. It's pretty straightforward. The ram will no longer push any further once it gets fully seated down into there and locks down around that collar. Then you just back off your pressure and remove your fitting and you have it be locked down. So you have six flats on there. I like to take that fitting and turn it one, say turn to the clockwise, put it back into the tool and then repress it just so that it squeezes in a slightly different orientation on that thing because you have these two jaws coming together at opposite angles, 180 degrees apart from one another. It's not as uniform as it might like it to be. Like a hydraulic shop, their tool might be actually pushing from all six points at once, whereas we're really only pushing it two points at once and relying on the rubber design of the jaws to actually kind of squeeze together onto that fitting. Now let's talk about how I actually make hoses for a specific project. And this is a very straightforward. Personally, I'd mock up all of the fittings that I'm gonna want where they're going to go. So I figure out if a 45 seems like it's gonna work or straight or whatever I'm trying to work with in various applications, a 180 coming out of the AC compressor or something like that. I just grab the hose that I'm gonna be working with and I stick it into one of those fittings, whatever line that I'm going to be making, I start with one end there and I might put a piece of blue tape on or something just to make sure that it doesn't fall out, though it holds usually well enough that that's not an issue. Then I purposely route it exactly how I I want it to be in the vehicle. I want to make sure that I'm not leaving excess length somewhere because this stuff, it's not nearly as flexible as other hoses. It is good and flexible, but it is very strong too. So it's going to want to have a mind of its own. So I want to make sure that I kind of hold it where it's going to be. On the C10, you can see here, I used blue masking tape to tape it to the inner fender. This isn't where it naturally wants to be. I'm going to have to put a clamp here that I'm going to make later. So I just wanted to be certain that I'm holding it exactly where I'm going to want it later so I don't have extra hose that's fighting me when I actually put it there. And then I just hold it up to the fitting that it's going to be next to and I mark it. Very straightforward. I take that, pull it out of my air and cut the hose off to the length that I need it. And really, that is how I produce hoses for vehicles. I mock them up in place. I line up the hoses where they're gonna be, mark them and cut them. There is more to it than that and I'll tell you in a second, but this is one of those things where people ask for the secret sauce tip. How do you do this? How do you assemble the lines? How do you lay them out so nice? I don't have a better answer than this. I've never found a measuring method that worked any better than just laying it out in the real world scenario that it's gonna be in. The one important factor it does come in play here. Once I cut the lines, I remock it up where it's going to be. I push it onto both fitting ends, make sure it's long enough, it routes how I want it to, lays how I want it to, all of that. When I do that, I then mark each end of the hose and I draw a line on both the fitting and the hose itself to make sure that I know where the orientation is. The idea here is these hoses are not clockable later. Once you crimp that hose onto the end of it, you will not be able to rotate the fitting. And you might get a little tiny bit of rotation give out of the hose itself, but not much at all. So you need to make sure that you have the clocking on each end of your hose exactly where you want it. This can be especially important if you're taking your hoses to somebody to have them crimp them. Make sure that they are aware of those marks and what they mean. 
And that's it for AC hoses. Maybe somebody out there has other setup that they use, but this is how I make custom AC hoses for the projects that I'm working on. It may not be how everybody does it or wants to do it, or you know, you may think that my way is just terrible, but honestly, it works for me, it works for my customers, and it works for the builds that I do. To this point, I've been very happy with doing it this way. Even on a high end, very custom builds, I think these rubber beadlock hoses can look really nice because they're crimped on. They, they look like something you bought in a store or came factory on a car, and that could really have a unique look to it. All right, folks, that is it for soft AC hoses. It's overall a very simple concept. I kind of went a little deeper into the hose theory and, and a few things about the design of the fittings and such, but I just wanted to, to inject a little more information in here. I didn't want it to just be super simple, like here's the pieces I use and here's how I assemble them, you're done. Even though it is kind of that simple of a topic. All right, folks, that's gonna wrap it up for this video. I hope you found it interesting. If you did, please drop it a like. Let me know in the comments down below. Did you find this interesting, useful? Are you gonna make your own custom AC hoses now? Let me know what you're thinking in the comments down below. Go ahead and get subscribed to keep up to date with all the Hot Rod Epic content. A whole lot more coming in 2021. Thanks for coming around, folks.